some love as you find your seats. Awesome. Hey, online, I'm so glad you're here on the long weekend with us, maybe from a cottage or a boat or a drive somewhere to somewhere. You're here in church, so I'm glad for that. But in the room, more than that, I'm glad you're here in this space. You've picked quite possibly, arguably, the best possible place that you could choose to be 10.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning of the long weekend in September. You made it here. Who's thankful to be here in church this morning? <laughs> Good. Yeah. I'm thankful to be here. My name is Greg. As I said, my wife Vanessa and I, we are part of the team here, uh, serving under the amazing leadership of Pastor Sam and Jess Pickin. They're over at our Midtown location, and you're in C3 Church today. So C3, we're part of a global family of churches all over the world. There's about 650 plus C3 churches, and uh, you're at one in Toronto that's led by the amazing Pastor Sam and Jess Pickin. We have three locations, one in Midtown at Young and Lawrence one here in downtown Toronto and one out in Hamilton. And uh, man, I love this church. Who loves this church? Phew, that would have been awkward if only like three people said I do. Uh, no, I'm part of the team here and uh, I'm thankful that you're here. We're in the middle of a series called Of God. Who's been loving our Of God series thus far? Of God, this is all around John 8. So you can churn, turn, churn, churn in your Bibles, churn, churn. To John 8, and we'll get into it. But man, we have had some amazing preaches from some amazing voices through the course of this series. Our location pastors have preached incredible words. Calvin launched the series with an unreal word uh, when we I was out in Vernon. But man, that guy can preach. I'm jealous. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's preaching skills. Uh, but I am thankful to be able to, like, send us off out of this series. And it's all centered around this idea of hearing God. And it's important that we talk about this because when we hear God, when we're confident that we're hearing God, we, we have a level of faith to continue forward. We discover more and more who we are, that as we hear God, we're strengthened with the mission that's before us, with an idea of what to do. And we are, we, we are confident for what's ahead regardless of the battles that we face. But if you're like me, when you're unsure if you're hearing from God, sometimes that can feel like a little bit of anxiety floods your world. It feels like, man, I feel a bit stuck in uncertainty as to whether or not God's speaking to me. And you feel like, I don't even know how to move forward. And, and our identity starts to get shaken a little bit. And, and we start to question ourselves and what's before us. And so I want to help free some people from that today to listen and lean in to the words that God's speaking. Uh, and what happens, like the best thing that I think that happens is when we hear God, we have peace and clarity. Who wants a little bit more peace and clarity in their world? Okay, thank you to the honest 17 of you. The rest of you, I would love to meet you and know your name and know where you get this piece from. Because <laughs> Toronto's a crazy city. Uh, no, let's lean in. Turn, in. turn to your neighbor and say, lean in. Lean in. We're going to hear from God today. John 8. Who's there in John 8 with me in your Bibles? A few of us. Awesome. It's on the screen behind me. If you're not there and there's this discourse between Jesus and the Pharisees and it's believed that like this is just a continuation off of John 7 where Jesus is talking in the midst of the festival of tabernacles and that's important and I'll get to that in a moment for all you Bible nerds. Uh, John 8 verse 12 when Jesus spoke again to the people he said I am the light of the world whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. My goodness, talk about peace and clarity. Having the light of life. Having this idea that I'm never going to walk in the hopelessness and the despair that I've been walking through. That I'm never going to have that same uncertainty that Jesus is committing as we follow him, as we walk in his ways, we'll never walk in darkness. But what we have to realize is to 
the Jewish audience at the time amongst the Feast of Tabernacles, what they would do is every single night they would light up all of the torches and pillars around the temple at the center of Jerusalem, like to the point that there would be essentially a pillar of light in the center of Jerusalem that reminded the people of God of these 40 days, or 40 years, sorry, 40 days, 40 years in the wilderness that God faithfully led his people. And, and in the day there would be a cloud to lead them, and at night there was what? A pillar of light, a pillar of fire. That God was leading his people. And so when Jesus says this to the religious people of the day, he says, I am the light of the world. See that pillar over there that's temporary and temporal? See that light that we're all looking to? It's actually me. I am him. And this offended some of the religious people at the time. So they're like, who is this guy I think he is? And they start to challenge some of his statements. And you can read through the discourse in John 8, and this is what we've been studying, but it's crazy what I've picked up through this is the level of confidence and assurance that Jesus had in his identity. That he knew he was a man on mission, but it wasn't his mission, it was the Father's mission. He, he says things like, the Father who sent me placed me here. You don't know me because you don't know my Father. He had this assurance of faith because it wasn't his own identity that he was representing. It was actually the identity and the mission of somebody else. That there was a greater authority that his life was submitted to. So it wasn't his agenda. It was the Father's agenda. So I think we can learn something from that. And it all culminates in this key verse uh, from which we've got this series premise from. John 8, verse 47. Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. And the reason you, Pharisees, do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Now, here's the thing. C3 Toronto, I see a room full of people who belong to God. Like, second service especially. Man, <laughs> you are belongers in the kingdom of God. Online, you belong to your Father in heaven. We're people who, who are commissioned on the greatest mission that exists in our day and age, and it's to extend and expand the kingdom of God. It's to bring the kingdom of light into dark places. And you're here in your seat on the long weekend especially. My goodness, are you a part of it. You belong. And that gives you confidence, and it gives you hope, and it gives you assurance, and it gives you strength. And it gives you this unoffendable nature so that when I start to speak into this idea that I believe we hear God more clearly based on how we submit to the voices that he's placed around us, that he's placed us under. You're like, oh, Greg's speaking about submission. Oh, hang on. <laughs> I was happy when he was telling me that I belong to God, but now I'm not happy when he's telling me that I should listen to the voices God's placed in my world. No, I know we can take that. I know we can learn something from it. I know that we can grow out of it. And so I've titled this message because I've been watching lots of shows with like, lawyers and discourse and different things. It's called, I submit that we submit. That's like a legal terminology. I want to submit this to you, people of C3 Toronto, that we submit our lives to a greater purpose than ourselves, to a greater voice than ourselves. And here's the thing, it's so crazy to me that this is such an easy concept to understand and to lean into when it comes to like team sports, okay? So I played rugby in high school. I know, that's hard to believe. It was like 70 pounds ago, at least. Played flanker. I played other forward positions. Uh, and it was, it was fun. It, was, it took strength and courage. My bones will break if I pray, played one minute of rugby today. Uh, but every team has a coach. And I remember, I vividly remember this one game where we were playing against this other team. And they had this, like, dude. He, I, don't, I can't even imagine this guy was in high school. He was, like, bigger than Jonathan Martin. He was, like, 350 pounds of pure muscle. He would, like, run around the field, stiff-arming everybody who came into his path. And, like, it was causing chaos and confusion amongst our team. We had plays to run, but we somehow lost sight of what those plays were because this, this truck of a human was destroying us. And the coach called his timeout. He's like, this isn't working. Timeout. Everybody come in. Team, come in. And, this, and the, the, the lean in in that huddle, that moment that's like, here's a voice of authority over this team that's going to create plan, a plan that will unify around one thing and it'll help us succeed. 
and, he, and he's like, okay, guys, this guy's not that big. I was like, okay, you're lying. <laughs> we, we, we know what to do here. Here's what we're going to do, guys. And everyone's leaning in around this plan and this vision. He's like, Greg, what's going to happen is that off this touch play, we know that they're going to give the ball to this giant tank. You're going to tackle him. I was like, yes, in Jesus' name. <laughs> And then four, other forwards, you're going to ruck over the ball. And then, and then the backs are going to pick up the ball and throw it out to the wing. And we're going to move forward. We're going to take some ground from this team that's been taking ground from us. This is our house. And the level of confidence that came out of that unification around a voice of authority, the confidence that it gave me to know that someone who's above me actually sees something in me, that I have the strength and the capacity to fight this battle that's ahead. We came out of that huddle ready to go. And they, sure enough, tapped the ball. Tank, 350-pound dude gets it. But I propped myself up, and I grabbed a hold of that guy with all the power that I had in me. And sure enough, I brought him to the ground. The forwards rocked over. The ball went out, and we took ground. But it was unifying around a voice of authority that saw something that we didn't see. And it's so easy in the context of a sports team to just get this. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, listen to a coach because he has a plan for how we're going to win. But then somehow we bring this in the context of a church life. And it's like, oh, hang on. You want me to lean into someone else's authority? You think someone sees more for my life than I see? Like, what are you talking about, Greg? We're going to digest this here today because I think that capacities and abilities that we don't even know are in us that can be unlocked through leaning into voices of authority in the room. So let's dive into this together. The first thought I want to bring out around this topic is dependence and submission are signs of strength and security. Jesus had so much strength and security in his deliberation with the Pharisees because he knew where he came from and where he was going. So John 8 Verse 13, the Pharisees challenge him when he says, I'm the light of the world. And, he, and they say, your testimony is not valid. And his response is, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. You have no idea where I've come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true. And this is the key. Because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. And that causes me to ask this question in the room and online is, who are you standing with? Who's sending you? Because this idea of being sent, being commissioned, being given authority by someone else who has authority gives us strength and confidence to move forward in something that seems impossible. Jesus introduces this idea, but then repeats it over four more times. The word sent, the, gr the Greek word that represents this idea that is to, wait, wait for it, to be dispatched and sent away towards a designated goal or a purpose. In the course of 20 odd verses, Jesus says, I know who sent me. And then more than just four times, like 10 times plus, he's talking about, I, I'm here on my father's behalf. I only hear what the Father tells me. I only do what the Father tells me to do. He has this idea and this confidence and this strength because he knows where he comes from and he knows where he's going because he's submitted to an agenda that's not just his agenda. And I want to suggest to us at the 1030 service that there is an agenda that we can submit our lives to that is beyond our agenda that will change our world completely. That if we can lean in to voices of authority, the purpose that will be unlocked in our life, the clarity and the peace that will be given as we lean into the people of God that he's placed around us, will change our world. Apostelin, pemsas, these are the Greek words, probably not because my Greek is horrible. <laughs> but they're, it's a synonym. It's the, it, they, they mean the exact same thing and they're repeated and and it's this idea of sending with a designated goal or purpose. And this is the way God operates, is sending. In the Old Testament, he sent Moses to lead his people who were in captivity to a place of promise and freedom. He sent the prophets 
to remind God's people of what he said and what he commissioned and, and how they ought to live their lives. Then he sent John the Baptist to prepare a way for Jesus' ministry. And he sent Jesus, his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then Jesus said that my father will send you a helper, the Holy Spirit, and with him greater things you'll do than what I do. You see all these miracles I'm doing? Well, guess what? I've been apostelling, and the Father is apostelling somebody else that's better and greater, and he's going to commission you to do great things. But then more than that, he sent his church out. He sent leaders to places and regions, and he said, go, preach the word of the Lord. Go, make disciples of all nations and teach these people to obey all that I have commanded you to do. Surely I will be with you to the ends of the earth. And he's sending his church. He's sending people, he's sending leaders into our lives to speak to us the vision and the word of God that can change us and activate us on a mission that's going to change the world. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul puts it this way. He's just bigging up his team, his team of church planters. He's encouraging them. And he said, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia. They've devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. And I urge you, brothers and sisters, submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. There's some good advice from Paul. You want to be on a great mission? Submit to somebody who's on a great mission. These guys are making a serious difference. Man, if you can lean in and, and hear what these guys are telling you to do, you'll be on a great mission of service to your city. And we, we get this complaint, like, I can't find the right voice. I've been looking for mentors for years. I just, I find myself from one place to another place, and I just can't find the right mentor. Well, I want to challenge that thought a little bit. I think here, so C3 Toronto, I've got, we've just launched 43 downtown connect groups have just launched. I have 270 reasons to say you have somebody to find <laughs> that you can lean into. We have 195 individual connect leads and team leads across all of our location. There's 75 coaches and head coaches. There's pastors and leadership teams who have been appointed, yes, by God, but also by the leadership of this house to change something in the hearts of many. And there isn't nearly enough to see the city of Toronto change. That God is asking you in your seat to engage on his mission and say yes to the calling of God and submit yourself under an authority that God has set up to see your world changed. And the question that I have is, will we accept the call? Will we say yes to submitting to those who are laboring at the Lord's work? I'm certain that our ability to do this, to say, not my will, Lord, but yours be done, it will be a display of strength and security, that dependence and submission are signposts of strength and security. And it's not just about us. It's not that I feel secure when my life is submitted to a voice of authority. More than that, the people around me can feel more secure in my decision making. That if, if, if as I'm following Pastor Sam and his leadership, I'm confident in it because one, he has to make an account before the Lord for every decision he directs me to make. That's Simple enough, that's one easy mindset. But more than that, he himself is submitted to voices of authority, like Pastor Lauren as a spiritual father, Pastor Phil as the founder of this movement, that there's voices speaking into my leader who's speaking into me, so I know that it's a safe place to lay my life down before. But also what that does is it creates security for Vanessa, my wife, when she knows that I'm not just on Greg's mission for the Fry family, that I actually have accountability in my world, that there's somebody who can speak into character flaws that are in me, which there's none of, <laughs> who, can, who can speak into habits and mindsets that need to change, who can, who can correct language and adjust behaviors in the way I'm treating Vanessa, who can give me advice on, on what might help me help her. That creates not just a place of strength and clarity and peace for me, it creates strength and confidence for her as my wife, that the people around us are counting on us to lean in and say yes to God by saying yes to the people that God has placed us under. Which brings me to my second thought, and this is no holds barred, okay? So don't apologize, don't, you know, 
whatever. The, okay, point two, the devil's, way, the devil's way is independence, God's way is submission. The devil has an agenda for your and my life. It's to steal, kill, and destroy. That he wants us living in chaos and confusion. He wants us living in darkness and in fear. He wants anxiety to fill our world. And God wants life. He wants strength. He wants peace and clarity and unity for us. And he has a pathway to do it. And it's this pathway called submission. It's this pathway that's called not my will, but yours be done, Father. And more than that, it's this pathway that says, I'm going to trust the church that you have set in this city. The, I know that oh, there's no authority here on earth that God has not appointed. And so as I trust God, I'm going to trust the leaders that he's placed me under. But the big problem that we face is that the devil's a liar. He's like, you can't trust that church. You can't trust that person. You've got, you've got to wait. You, you're in relationship with God. Why do you need to listen to those people? It's these subtle little things that are, it's like, I don't actually know if that's the way the Bible works, but the devil has this loud voice that challenges the ways of God. He did it to Adam and Eve in the garden. He's like, did God really say that you mustn't eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil? If you eat it, you'll be better than God. You'll be like God. And we have this same opportunity today that we can take the knowledge and the wisdom and the know everything, and yet God is offering us a tree of life that says submit your life to a purpose that's beyond you. Submit your mission to a voice that's higher than you and watch what I do through it. Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and, and he challenges this idea of uh, who they're listening to and the voice that they're listening to and the fact that the devil's a liar. I'm not going to read the verses for the sake of of time, but he said, he ends with that de the devil is the father of lies. When he lies, he speaks his native language. And is it possible that there's lies about submission that we have been believing? It's like, man, if I do it this way, I'm going to lose my purpose. If I if if I tr I've been hurt, and this is just another opportunity to be hurt, submitting my life. To the voice of another, another human who's fallen by nature? This sounds like a bad plan. And these are lies that the devil uses to pollute our mind. Hey, here's the thing, guys. This is a safe place. This is a secure place. This is a place under godly authority. This is a place that will probably make mistakes. You join a connect group and you lay your life out before the connect leader. There's a, a chance, a very small one, but there's a chance that they might give you some advice that, that everything doesn't work out the way that you planned it. But God has an opportunity to use those parts of our, of our story for his greater glory. And I know the blessing of the house that we live under because I've been living under it for the past 15 years. And my life has been radically transformed. I, I would never have anticipated what I get to do and who I get to be. But Pastor Sam and Jess saw something in Vanessa and I. And they spoke it into being. By faith they saw that which wasn't as if it was. And they've called out character things. They've adjusted habits. And we've been the beneficiaries of this relationship. Culture tells us and the devil th tells us that the independent path is the strong path. That if, I'm, if I can be self-made, then I'm strong. If I know all the right things to say and all the right things to do, if I don't need anybody else in my life to direct me and to guide me, that means I'm a strong leader, I'm a confident person, I'm a world changer because I've got the goods. But I want to suggest that that's actually a sign of the most insecure, weak, and feeble person, that it actually takes far more strength to release control of our lives to say, yeah, I have the power, the ability, the decision-making capacity to move forward, but I know that God appoints voices and authority, and I know God can be trusted, and it takes strength and courage to let go and say, God, I'm trusting you with this, and I'm going to ask my connect leader about it. I'm going to ask my coach about it. I'm going to approach my team lead and ask questions. I've seen way too many people saying, I want to see God change the nation through my story. I want to I minister 
to broken communities in this city. And these are all amazing, great purposes and vision. But the problem sometimes is we don't want to pay the price of surrender and a submission. That we don't want, we, we, we have our own vision. And so we don't want to submit to another person's vision. But I have too many stories in my life to prove the opposite of just that. That life is found through submission. That hope is found through submission. That strength is found through trusting the voice of another, a shepherd. So I'll share one of these stories here and now. Vanessa and I, we were just a year married in Calgary, Alberta, the most wonderful city in the West, the place of the stampede, the greatest outdoor show on earth. And the Calgary mindset was like, buy a home, white picket fence, dog, couple of kids, this is the dream of life. And we owned a condo at the time, and we were going to sell our condo and buy a new house. But the Calgary market was not that crazy. Like, man, moving to Toronto, talk about a different real estate market. At the time, it was like, we'll find a house to buy first, we'll put a conditional offer, and then we'll sell our condo. Because that's what makes sense. And, uh, and I remember at the time, we went for this, and it was like, nothing was working. For whatever reason, no matter how slow the Calgary real estate market was, it was hot for every house that Greg and Vanessa wanted. It's like, it, listing comes up, sold. Listing comes up, sold. It's like, why are all these other houses not selling, but the ones that we want just keep selling? And then the Holy Spirit kind of convicted us a little bit, like, have you spoken to voices of authority in your life about this situation? And at the time, we were serving under Pastor Sam and Jess in their youth and young adults ministry in Calgary. And so I remember we were out on... Uh, out at the lake with them and we we're just talking about life and we're like hey what uh, would you guys like pray with us we're facing this situation we we really want to buy a house because that feels like the right move uh and it's just not working and it was pastor sam and jess i love the visionary people that they were who were voices of authority in our life but they were also submitted to voices of authority what they knew is they were going to move to from calgary to toronto within about the next year they also knew, man, it would be great to have these guys come with us. But they also weren't released yet from their leaders to start talking about that. So there's this tension of Greg and Vanessa have this opportunity that actually is going to create an anchor for them in Calgary. And all they could say was, hey, before we pray, have you considered, like, maybe you're just not supposed to buy a house right now? Like, just trust us. I don't think you should buy a house right now. <laughs> And I'm pres we're presented with an opportunity. Do we trust the leader that God has placed us under? Or do we trust our own voice of God that says, this is the right move. This is the right plan. This is the right step. And then we made a decision. Okay, we called mom, who's our realtor. We said, hey, stop the searches. I just don't think it's time. And she's like, okay, well, that's strange. Why? And it was like, ah. It just, Pastor Sam and Jess said, maybe it's not time. She's like, and I love my mother-in-law. She's a woman of God. She's like, okay, they said it. We'll trust it. Canceled the searches. Two weeks later, we're in Kuala Lumpur at a C3 Global Conference. There's an altar call that's like, come to the front if you know you need to be involved in a church plant in the next two years in some way, shape, or form. Vanessa and I blasted out of our seats. We ran to the front. And we didn't know what it meant at the time, but all of a sudden there was clarity that perhaps this plant is not going to be in Calgary. And then Pastor Sam and Jess, a few months later when they were released to invite people, they asked us, would you come with us to Toronto? We're like, yeah. They're like, you should probably pray about it first. And we already have. <laughs> <laughs> but check this out. Then in June, nine months later, we fly across the country with our leaders in the craziest real estate time that there probably was houses, like we, we set up searches, but it was pointless because every house that looked interesting in this tiny little pocket that we could afford was sold before we could even look at the pictures. We flew across for three days, us and Pastor Sam and Jess, and out of that we bought two, each of us bought a house in this city that we were moving to. And it's the, it was this beautiful house with a beautiful fence and space for our family to grow. And it was like the beginning point of what we see here today started in faithful moments where it's like I'm going to trust the authority that God has placed in my world. The miracles that happened out of those houses, the, the, the provision that God made, but more than that, the home he created for his church that started with simple, subtle trust in God. Now, not every one of us is necessarily going to be 
moving 3,000 kilometers away out of a voice of trust me in this. Trust God in this. But there are little decisions that we make that God perhaps has a key locked up in the voice of somebody else. And so I want to make this practical to us. What does it look like to submit to godly leadership? Find the path of righteousness. Find the path that leads to life. Well, first of all, join a connect group and commit to being at that connect group. Like every week, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to give space for God to speak. I'm going to join this team, and I'm going to stay on this team. And then whoever's leading that team, I'm going to find myself under them, and I'm going to ask them questions. What are you seeing in me doing that I should stop doing? What am I doing that I should do more of? What's, what is something that I might be missing in helping me grow with God, what's a gap that you see? If we approach a, a God-appointed authority, a, a commissioned voice, and we ask these questions, I guarantee you God will use those moments and those conversations to unlock purpose in us. Hebrews 13, the writer puts it this way. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Why? This is a key part of leaning into godly voices because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden. For that would be of no benefit to you. I'll bring the keys up. The opposite of this verse is true as well. That is, if we, sub, if we submit to the authority of our leaders, it will be a benefit to us. It's saying if you don't do it, it won't be of benefit to you. But the opposite is true. If you do do it, you're the one who flourishes from it. I'm the beneficiary of a, of a life in leadership that I've trusted the pathway of our lives, the vision of our lives, to a voice of authority that God appointed over me, and my world's been changed because of it. It will always benefit us as we trust the voices that God has placed around us but the devil is a liar and he tells us be independent be strong have it your way and God the gracious gracious shepherd is saying submit to my voice by submitting to the voice of the shepherd he's saying the shepherd sees further than the sheep the shepherd sees things that the sheep don't see the shepherd cares for the sheep the shepherd wants life for the sheep. Would you trust the shepherds that I've put in your world? The last thought I want to land on is that true submission comes only from true surrender. This would be a hard message, a hard pill to swallow if we were just talking in the context of some corporation, some organization, some person specifically, but ultimately the reason that we can be confident in submitting to godly voices that he has placed around us is we are people who are surrendered to Christ. We recognize that Jesus died so that he could birth his church and send out leaders of his church and commission those people with the power of the Holy Spirit to equip us, the saints, for the ministry of Christ that we also as we lean in, can be raised up to be ministers of the living God, that if we trust God, then we can trust the leaders that he's placed around us. I'm not able to do this and trust Pastor Sam and Jess's voice in mine and Vanessa's life because of how much I love him. I do love him. He's amazing. He's wonderful. But I do this because I love and worship the living God. And I know that there's no authority on this planet that he is not appointed. That if I trust him with everything I have, I will be led to life and to strength and to hope. I know that when it comes to God's church, God cares for his church. You are God's church. And he cares for you. He shepherds you. He wants the best for you. And it's possible that the best for you is being unlocked through the voice of another. The encouragement of another. I'll share one more story of our world that happened recently. And there's tons of these. But about three years ago in January, two and a half years ago, we sat around the table as a planning team. And it was like coming out of the pandemic, we weren't even really meeting in person properly yet. We were meeting in the afternoon at another church. And uh, we felt as a team, and especially Pastor Sam and Jess felt strongly, hey, I think it's time to launch a location in Hamilton. And some of the team, I 
myself included, is like Hamilton's like 65 minutes away and we're not even really doing church downtown yet. Are you sure? <laughs> They're like, no, I'm sure. And then I saw this frustration in my leader because he was trying to lead a church out of the pandemic and he was trying to finish his masters and he was trying to look after his family and there was all this tension in his world that he felt, I just don't have the bandwidth to do what I feel like God's asking me to do. I can't even go to Hamilton and find a space that we can meet in. How am I gonna launch a church location out there? And Vanessa and I saw that frustration. And it's like, I never felt that I'm meant to help start a location. I don't feel like a lead guy. I don't feel like I have those skill sets. That feels like the 350 pound dude causing terror and chaos on the team. But I'm like, hey coach, <laughs> what do you need? What do you think I should do? in this play. There's unity and alignment around this plan to launch a location. And he's like, honestly, if you could just go there and find a location to do church in, that would be awesome. So Vanessa and I rearranged a week. We went out there. We looked at like 60 odd locations and three good ones. No, <laughs> there was like probably about 60 locations that we narrowed down to six. And through the course of these couple months that we were searching for venues, we consistently said, hey, we don't think we're the people to go help launch this location, but if you believe that we are and you ask us to go, we'll go. And then come March, beginning of March, Pastor Sam and Jess came up to look at the six locations we had narrowed it down to. We found one that's like, this is gonna work, this is awesome. And then we sat down for tacos at this restaurant in Hamilton called The Mule. And I remember over these tacos, they looked across the table at us and they're like, so? How do you feel about moving to Hamilton and helping start a church location in here? And at that point, because we were submitted under voices of authority and we had already made a commitment that if you ask us to go, we'll go. It's like no really wasn't an option at that point. Not because we would be letting them down, but ultimately we would be letting ourselves down. We would be letting God down because we had submitted our lives to this cause. And it was like, yeah, let's do it. If you believe we can do it, then I believe we can do it. If you see something in this for us, then we see something in this for us. And three weeks later, because we're crazy people, we were in Hamilton. We moved house. We were renting out our house in Toronto. Now that journey came with many pressures, many frustrations, many difficult moments. But I can tell you the amount of strength of relationship that was built in our marriage, the amount of confidence that was deposited in us from God saying, you can, you've got this, the amount of dependence on him that it created in us that we already had, but now we're in the middle of what feels like wilderness, of what feels like crazy, but we're leading to the, God's promise for our life. We were growing and changing and being shaped. And the cool thing about it is not just we were changed, but there's like, 130 plus people engaging every single week in C3 Hamilton. There's people that were in brokenness in their marriage that have found restoration in their marriage. There's people that have experienced healing and hope. There's people that have given their lives to Christ. And it's not for our glory. It's for God's glory. Vanessa's mom, Patricia, felt when we were moving that maybe I should move across the country to be a support to Greg and Vanessa. And we kept saying, no, you shouldn't, mom. <laughs> but she had this impression, God's asking me to do this. And what happened in that move is she was a woman who loves God, like loves the spirit of God. But there was always a tension with her in the church because she's been through very many difficult moments. And it was always a thing that mom and I would deliberate about because I'm like this person who's like, God's church is the way he made it. It's the way he planned it. Like, and she just didn't have necessarily the right voices in different times and she was hurt by different people and that sucked. But as she decided from our obedience that she would move her life across the country, what she's found is like this redeeming nature in her relationship with the church. She's serving on kids team and she's ministering to the next generation. She's finding more about her purpose as a woman in her 60s through a plantedness in a house that took our simple steps of trusting the leaders above us. That led her to her simple steps of trusting the leaders above her. And I know there's so many stories, so many more stories than this that I could share, but I want to leave us with this thought that God can be trusted. 
that the leadership that God appoints can be trusted. Let's just close our eyes for a moment here at the end. That we can do this out of peace and surrender to God. And I'm just praying even now that the Holy Spirit would move around the room, that he would move online in every room that you're watching from, every area that you're sitting in. And if there's any pain, if there's any hurt, if there's any disappointment that's come from trusting this way in the past, I pray for the redeeming and reconciliating power of the Holy Spirit to heal hearts, to restore relationships, to give strength and courage, to fill our hearts even with a new level of perspective and trust in you, God, that you would speak to your people and remind us that your way is perfect, that your way can be trusted, that your way is good. Hey, as our eyes are closed here at the end of this message, as I've said, we can only do this, trust godly leaders out of a place of surrender to Christ. And there would be people here in this room at the end of this message that you know in your heart of hearts you're not living a life surrendered to Christ. That you're probably following your own agenda. You're probably following after your own purposes. You're doing it on your own. And maybe you've made a decision in the past to commit your life to Christ, but you know in your heart of hearts you've turned away and you've run away from that decision. In a moment, I'm going to ask you with every eye closed and with every head bowed to just slip up your hand to acknowledge, yeah, I need Christ on the throne of my life again. There would be people here that you've never made this type of decision before. But you've got this crazy person up at the front of the stage that's talking about purpose and life. And you're like, there's something in this. The first step that you need to make is to say, yes, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. So as we come to a close here with every single head bowed and every single eye closed, one of those two people in the room, you've made this decision before, but you know in your heart of hearts you've turned away. You want to recommit your life to Christ. Or you're in this room and for the very first time, you're saying, yes, this is me. I need Jesus in my life. Can you just slip up your hand? I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to put a spotlight on your world. But if that's you, can you be brave and throw your hand up in the air? I'd love to include you in a prayer that you want to commit. Awesome in the middle. Awesome on the side. Awesome at the far right there. I see you. There's three people that are lifting up their hands. The only awesome miss on the left, my left, your right. I see you. You can put your hand down. There's four people, five people in the side section there. I see that. There's six up the top. Awesome. On the balcony there, you can put your hand down. The only reason I'm counting is I want you to know you're not alone in making this decision. Is there anybody else here under the sound of my voice that you want to make a commitment to following Christ today? Beautiful. Well, church, we're going to stand up. And we're going to praise God for these six people that are making decisions today to commit their lives to Christ. This is the best decision that you can make. It's a decision that leads to life. It's a decision that leads to hope. It's a decision, decision that leads to courage. But here's the thing. We never make this decision alone. We don't have to walk out this journey without companionship and community. So what we're going to do now is we're all going to pray a prayer together as God's church. We're going to pray a prayer in unity. And it's a prayer of repentance that makes our life right with God. It's the beginning point of your journey with Him. And then Chrissy's going to give some instructions. So just repeat after me as we pray. Say, Dear Jesus, I thank you that you died on a cross for me. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new. Help me follow you from this day forward. Put the right voices, the right leaders, the right people in my world that I might follow you as Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise.